This is the Cheers Podcast. Hi, I'm Patrick Everett from the Cheers Podcast. I know it's been a while, but I wanted to pop in and share a discussion I had with the RGV Greens on September 30th, 2022 at the People's Debate. We were located outside the UTRGV Edinburgh campus, where Democrat Beto O'Rourke and Republican Greta Abbott were performing their one and only so-called debate for the ruling class, for their donors, and their media. If we lived in a democracy, we would have had Delilah and other political parties participating inside. Not to debate each other as a form of performative infighting to be consumed as entertainment, but as a robust democratic forum to determine leaders who would satisfy the people's agenda. Unfortunately, this debate that was happening inside did not substantially discuss what is on the people's agenda like climate, environment, energy, and socioeconomic securities as expected. To meet the challenge of today, it is required to change from capitalism to socialism, to reduce our greenhouse emissions and avoid more extreme weather events that exhaust our critical infrastructure and contribute to continuous displacement of people, to end all wars and instability from U.S. foreign intervention that creates refugees to move from the global south to the global north. We only have a limited electorism, a pay-to-play scheme where private entities determine the rules on how to and who can participate without much input from the people. The good thing is we have grassroots movements pushing back against this one evil party with two names and our platform in socialism for the people of Texas. I was joined by Ali and Gloria, two volunteers of the RGV Greens, representing the Green Party and Delilah Barrios, who unfortunately could not make this event in Edinburgh. The People's Debate is an opportunity for the Green Party to raise their voice, interact with the people, to let the people know about their campaign and platform in person and online. Without any other delay, here's my discussion with the RGV Greens outside the 2022 Texas Governor Debate. Well, thank you for having us, and we're in kind of a funny uh, situation right now, and for people at home listening, and they can't see where we are, I just want to kind of set the stage a little bit. We're sitting in a lawn right next to University Boulevard in Edinburgh, uh, kind of in no man's land, and this is what it's sometimes called a free speech zone. In this case, they have up signs calling this a... Uh, candidate supporter area, uh, but what it means is that um, we don't have the right to protest in front of the debate, not even in front of the building of the debate. They have us corralled off with a lot of police around uh, watching all the activists um, pretty much on the side of the road. So that that's how they treat um, the people, the citizens, the voters, kind of like uh, trash that has to go out next to the gutter. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and I have to add, too, that this is a joke of a debate uh, that they're having inside. These candidates uh, are really just competing to raise the most money. That's how, um, unfortunately, our politics is, of course, around the world, but especially here in America. Uh, it's not about who can earn the most votes by having the best ideas. It's who can raise the most money. Then they use that money to, to put ads on TV, do mailers, do do things to uh, persuade people to vote for them, but they're not offering real solutions. They're not reaching out to the people um, for deep support, for for deep um, organizing, long-term solutions. It's just that the other guy's bad, the other guy's scary, so you should vote for me. And that's not a, a way to improve our country or improve our state here in Texas. So um, we planned a people's debate, and what that means is it's just an opportunity for us in the Green Party to raise our voice, and we can't be inside the debate because of the debate rules that, that block out um, third parties. Uh, but we're here outside the debate, and so thank you so much for hosting this podcast and giving us a, a, a place to uh, share our, our opinions on what's going on. And uh, we did plan, though, to 
have some of our fellow Green Party members uh, share with us the, the debate questions live as they're coming in from, from inside the building that, that we're blocked from. So in just a second, I'm going to uh, read the first one or two debate questions and we'll kind of discuss uh, our perspective as Greens. And I'll just, uh, I should introduce myself as well. My name's Allie, I live in McAllen, and I think RGV is one of the most special and unique parts of the whole country. Definitely the best part of Texas that I've been to, and I've been all around Texas. So we have a precious community here, and we need support, we need real leadership, we need to end corruption, and having a debate with no audience members and not even allowing uh, the public um, <laughs> to, uh, to, to protest uh, is, is not going to help the people here. So um, with that said, in just a second, I will figure out what the first debate question was and we can discuss um, the green perspective, which is, we think, the people's perspective. Okay, so here's the first question. It was on immigration. And I'll ask you, Gloria, but I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot. We can discuss the answer. Um, uh, what would you do to alleviate the financial burden on these border communities from immigration? That's, the, that's First of all, let me just give commentary. That's a loaded question, and I disagree with the premise of the question. Framing immigration as a problem and as an economic, economic burden instead of an economic benefit, if we have more workers, if we have uh, healthy communities, if we, ha if we can reunite families, that's a benefit to our community. It's not a burden. And I believe that um, as far as like border security and all that, most of that is already covered by the federal government. I mean, the state has their role, but I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this, the federal government is already paying a significant amount of the border security costs. So I, politicians um all of them want to all of them kind of like we kind of depend on people from mexico coming in to buy our stuff <laughs> right so if all the po local politicians will say we want to further trade and you know so it's kind of weird framing and it kind of shows like you're not really from here if you know you don't see that like i mean yeah, you, you'll you see, like, most people that go sh come shopping to the malls are people from Mexico that are actually more better off than the people here, and they depend on those sales. Um, but that's not the whole picture. The border, like, I think what's really messing is, like, you know, we're, we're military zone, like, seen, like, in the eyes of the government, like, we're heavily policed and like heavily like heavily policed it's heavily militarized and the so-called financial burden it comes from taking money away from the community and putting it in all in ice in border patrol in the police and so that's not even like an option in the way the question is asked next question and i think we can it's very similar we can answer it quickly operation lone star is a $4 billion uh, state-funded program, um, should more, which is, they don't say it here, but that's, you know, the state's uh, border protection uh, sham, I would say. Their, uh, their political show that they put on. Uh, should more money be allocated to Operation Lone Star, and if so, how much? Well, my answer to that would be no, no more money should be allocated to that. Let's defund the police, including defunding the border patrol and it's I do not believe that that kind of spending makes us safer and it's ridiculous and actually it's very Operation Lone Star has been excessive like it's been it's actually a lot of money and I've like I've actually so I heard just like somebody from my work was visiting the valley and they stayed in a hotel in Harlingen and the whole the entire hotel was full of the National Guard they're just sitting there waiting around because there's actually nothing to do 
<laughs> there's more, you know, more National Guard sent here than, than is necessary. And they, they're just, you know, the yeah, the, what Ali said, they're political props. They're, it's just a waste of money. And also it's just intimidation. It's just, it's just psychologically, it's militarizing, you know, our area. Well, let's go into the, the, the problem. Why is there like a record influx of refugees coming over? Like that's like they see that influx, they think it's a negative thing, it's impacting. But what's causing those people to live to leave where they live? Which if if it was me, it's you're gonna ruin my life before I had to leave this place. So put yeah. yourself in their shoes. Like what causes them to leave over here? Yeah, you're. I think what you're. Oh, oh yeah. I think what you're implying or, or kind of what you're saying is there's a push and pull to immigration. There's there's a reason people leave bad conditions where they're coming from and then there's the appeal of the destination that they want to go to. So I think that right now there's a lot of uh, immigration for both reasons. People are suffering poverty uh, in, especially in Central America. Uh, a lot of the refugees are not coming straight from Rex Mexico. They come from El Salvador. They come from Venezuela. Uh, most, in many cases, they're countries that are suffering because of U.S. sanctions or the U.S. drug war or the U.S. Um, you know programs of um, destabilizing uh, those countries for one reason or, or another, trying to maintain our basically our hegemon control of of the region. Our, um, our leadership. Yeah, our leaders want to. Well, no, uh, maintain our leadership over yeah, the world. Yeah, maintain our con yeah our leadership, our our dominance. Um, so that's you know the reason why people leave out of you know generally economic desperation, and then um, sometimes they come because the the there's rumors or there's um, news that, that give people the idea that that this is a place that they can come for safety, for security, for jobs. And I think that's a good thing. I hope that people do come here for a better life. But, I mean, there's been tragedies that have happened, like the Haitian refugees who um, somehow the Haitian community got some kind of viral message on Facebook to go to a certain place to cross, and then they were basically um, rounded up like cattle on, on men on horseback with whips. It's, it's obscene, you know what happens and so so when, um, when they start crossing over here and we have this debate and they start using it as a political chip so they could get the donors get the fundraising because this they like to play a game with this issue which is a, a sincere significant issue uh, people leave again displaced by force and now these politicians are trying to milk this issue like how do you feel about that well i think it's founded on racism because there's, if you look across the, Texas, we'll focus on Texas because, of course, we're here at the gubernatorial debate. It's an um, America-wide problem. But if you look across Texas, there's poverty, there's violence, there's people with housing insecurity, there's people who can't get health care, there's desperation uh, and you know horrible conditions, especially, I would say, in... Uh, the big cities, but in rural areas too. So I believe the reason the border gets so much attention as, as a quote-unquote problem <laughs> compared to other parts of Texas is because of racism, bottom line. It's xenophobia and racism. That's why the border gets so much attention. There's, there's, there's violence in Houston. There's violence in Austin. There's of course, the shooting in Uvalde is an obvious thing that, that we can point to as a, a tragedy that happened inside our state that had nothing to do with the border. So, of course, you know, everyone wants safety and security everywhere. Everyone wants um, to fight poverty everywhere. But the border has turned into a political cudgel that's ludicrous and and completely disproportionate to the the problems caused by the situation at the border. I I could point to ten other issues in the state of Texas that I think are much more serious issues than the quote unquote border security. I, I know there's a record influx of the refugees. Well, uh, why 
do you think they're purposely separating or creating that perception gap between reality that um so to pivot back to like the original it, i'm gonna tie it back in to the original question about like why are there so many immigrants coming here or what why like, it, yeah like the the actual causes so it's back so most of the immigrants coming here are fleeing imperialist wars they're fleeing wars that the u.s has spent money on to either sanction to manipulate and to and to you know destabilize those countries and so they flee here out of desperation and they instead of um instead of being allowed to work you know in this country with like protections and benefits they're being pushed to work with low like minimum wage or even like very very low pay and very little protection and that is what drives our economy our economy is based on this kind of exploitation and so this is the connection that like something like the green party is allowed to say out loud that these um Democrats and Republicans don't want to make this connection. And so that's where all this separation comes from. That's why when they talk about the border, they're not going to mention the, the, he the, military, the heavy militarization. And they do it in a way that it's like, oh, let's make the Republicans look bad and mean. You know, they don't connect it to, you know, the, the whole system. I really like how you bring up something that they were neglecting when it comes to the these top concerns particularly border security and immigration which is imperialism uh, this current system requires debt domination to accumulate capital endlessly from extracting and importing limited natural resources and cheap labor from semi-periphery and periphery to, into the core while imposing exporting value-added products from multinational monopolies loans with structural readjustment conditions and currency devaluation to force the global south countries to remain under the love and over exploited that's not going to be discussed inside let me go ahead and just say that the next topic is uh, gun control and uvalde and um, they talk about uh, raising the age of buying assault uh, rifles and red flag laws as far as the green party um, I think that the party focuses on the big picture foreign policy that Gloria was just talking about and on the environment. Um, sometimes it's called eco-socialism, uh, which is also making the connection between the environment and the economy and the military industrial complex. And I would add the police uh, and prison complex is all inter interconnected and controlling our political system. So as far as the gun issue, I think that, uh, speaking for myself, I'm not a fan of guns. I just, uh, I just don't like violence in general. But I know that uh, our gubernatorial candidate, uh, Delilah, is um, more for, um, the, yeah, so for gun rights. Yeah, Oh, we could have a yeah. debate. But, but I, I just want to point out that I think that's a good thing about the Green Party is there's room for disagreement on a lot of issues. Yeah. And it's a very um, small D Democratic Party where if you do join the Green Party, either at the local level or at the state level, there's room to have debates on all kinds of topics. Um, I don't think there's room to have a debate on global warming or on... Um, imperialism or you know there's certain bedrock issues i would say for for the, the left and for the green party but but like guns i would say is is an issue that has more um flexibility within the party and I, and whether someone agrees with me or, or not on that issue i think it's a good thing that that the party has room to to debate and we do not have very many uh litmus tests and uvalde too i think we should talk about a little bit it's so it's such a horrible tragedy it happened really not that far from where we are here in edinburgh and um th those parents uh, i believe right now the some of the ovalde parents are having uh 
basically a, a, a sit-in or a vigil outside the school district office in Uvalde. And the last time I checked, they'd been out there for something like uh, 55 hours, you know, um, uh, just around the clock. They're kind of holding vigil because um, they're, they want to demand change with the school district and the way they handle the, the district police. And I just want to voice my support for them. Um, it's almost unimaginable what those families went through. And it, it's almost a series of tragedies that happened to them. Yeah. The shooting, of course. But then this period of time when the parents were outside and the police were outside and the police, rather than going in to confront the shooter, were literally holding back the parents, uh, putting some of the parents in handcuffs for, I wish I knew the number, I think it's something like 74 minutes um, that passed. Uh, it's just unbelievable to imagine the, the pain that those parents went through and from what I've been reading, I believe some of those children uh, slowly bled to death in that time. Some of those children would have lived if they had gotten out and, and been rescued um, quickly after being shot. And I believe that's the case of um, at least one of the teachers as well. I believe one of the teachers was on the phone with her husband. I mean, it's it's almost unimaginable to to think of a shooting you 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 kind of think oh they were shot that's horrible nothing could be worse than that and then you find out all, as slowly and slowly the details of that situation of, of the Evalde shooting um have been made public it's like it's even worse it, it every detail makes it worse and worse it's like the worst nightmare of any parent i'm sure and it's well, let me let me uh, ask this uh, these two part question, and it's on the same topic. Uh, many people here have friends or family that live there who have been impacted or know someone that has been impacted by this all U.S. American problem. Personally, I have friends that live there. And, You're and talking one, about school shootings. School shootings, yeah. but uh, I have a friend who or lives Uvalde in Uvalde specifically. Specifically, yeah. specifically Uvalde, yeah. but the parents there. Um, I have friends there, uh, and when I asked them uh, about his previous uh, concern about being jumped in the open field by armed coyote traffickers. Um, I asked him if it's still his top concern after the mass shooting in Uvalde. And he replied that it is. Uh, he's, he was telling me that he feels safe uh, being armed out there. Uh, rhetorically speaking and disturbing to attempt to rank, but what are the chances of being jumped in farmland compared to being trapped in a mass shooter incident in Texas? One is the exceptional U.S. American problem, but not seen as elsewhere with no scientific understanding about the causes. And the other, a genuine con concern, appears to be purposely exaggerated with a narrow lens to promote fear, division, obscure the consequences of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America, and further feeds the viciousness of the armed manufacturers and their PR wing housed in the NRA. Many years ago, after the Columbine shooting, which I believe at this point, I can't quite remember, but I think that's over 20 years ago was a Columbine school massacre and Michael Moore made a film Bowling for Columbine and I saw the film and it was it was compelling and in a nutshell his his thesis was that the problem isn't gun ownership or gun laws it's American culture American violence and it it's rooted in our imperialism and our war footing and um I I don't know that I can argue against that. It's it's such a complicated problem. Who can explain why a young man feels so angry or unhappy or yeah. who who knows exactly what impulse drives that person to go and do that shooting? It's it's and I hope for most of us it's unimaginable. But I would say that actually the title of Michael Moore's film, Bowling for Columbine, that was because those shooters went bowling before they went and did the killing. And it almost makes it seem like if there was more positive things in our culture, if there was more community building in our culture, if there was more places for people to play a game and do something fun together, people to just go bowling or to play ping pong or whatever, you know, people to get together and build community rather than people feeling isolated and you know kids staying home alone um or whatever the case may be 
I don't know. There's no, I, I feel like I'm being glib. I don't want to act like there's a simple solution or, Oh, just have more, have more recreation. Well, yeah. Have more well, effortable programs. That's, that's, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we need to look at our culture yeah. and I do not believe that gun laws alone are the way to stop school shootings. Yeah. And do you want to? Yeah. Cause we, we might have a different perspective. Yeah. So after like close to the Valde shootings, um, my niece, uh, she's in middle school and her school actually had a lockdown. No, nothing happened, but our, the, none of the parents were notified. So my, my cousin found out through another friend and their daughter was old enough to have a cell phone. And so she texted her mom like, Hey, there's a, a lockdown, but without that connection, my cousin, my niece's mom would not have known. So, and this school like is pretty well off and every time there's a shooting or some kind of you know tragedy there's all of the money that comes in is for more more policing more like telling kids oh wear a mesh backpack or we're gonna you know we're gonna have a metal detector we're gonna bring in police dogs and nothing for let's you know Let's increase, let's increase the resources for our communication system. Let's make a like make a evacuation plan. Let's make a, a plan, like some sort of notification system. Let's get parents involved. No community building. And that goes back to like, I think that goes, that's connected to like reassessing our culture. Like every time an event happens, the debate or the question is should we arm teacher gun teachers with guns or should we increase security or sh you know things like that and nothing about the welfare of the kids the welfare of the parents like you know giving them space to grieve or any of that so our school systems like the way they're designed um like the history of of like public schools or like the school it's it was kind of like a like I, I think in the U.S. it was like a way to get like the factory like the factory the parents that are working the factory couldn't you know have their kids with them so they would be kind of hoarded in two like together and they would be trained to work in like a, in a factory like in a conveyor belt so all of our like disciplinary rules are about obedience and not about learning and like growing and or learning leadership or, learning leadership or creativity. creativity like all of these things and this is this plays into the lack of community in our culture like our kids are being raised to not think for themselves to blindly be obedient and and if you have any kind of if you want to be creative, if you think differently, you're punished for it. And so it, you know, so then we kind of normalize this in the, in, in the U S by saying like, when you're a kid, you're playful. And when you're an adult, you become, you become kind of nostalgic and like, uh, you know, there's all these jokes about like adulting, like, <laughs> and like, you know, adult life, how it's pretty much over. And that's, it's not true. It's just, how we have designed our culture so we, we we give up and we don't stand up for ourselves and we work for minimum wages and we tolerate these you know lack of material conditions so but i think it is connected i think that education history is a fascinating topic and i'm so glad you brought that up there's a few different i mean it's a Big issue. I, I wish we could do a podcast just on that, to be honest. But um, Delilah pointed out that uh, this is a official today. This Today's date is an official day of remembrance for Native Americans. And I believe the issue in particular um, that's being lifted up today is uh, the boarding schools. And this is a really sad part of U.S. history that 
gets very little attention, but for a long time, Native American children were stripped away from their families and sent to boarding schools for the express purpose of teaching them the dominant culture, white culture, uh, to make sure they didn't learn their native language, to basically prepare them to be, as Gloria was saying, to prepare them to be workers in um, low-wage jobs. So that's a really disgusting stain on U.S. history um, that gets not enough attention. And then more broadly, um, the history of education includes... Um, in more recent years, I'll just jump ahead <laughs> from the boarding school um, situation that was um, uh, years ago. But Genocidal. Yes, very good. It was genocidal. Um, so I'm sorry to not, yeah, I'm sorry to not delve into that topic more, but I want to uh, mention in, you know, more recent years, uh, our education system is being destroyed by things like teaching to the test by uh, under-training and underpaying teachers, by undermining teachers' unions. And um, I, would, I would urge people, if you're interested in this topic of um, t uh, education history and, and public education, to look into Diane Ravitch, who's an education historian, and she has a blog and really goes into great depth on uh, what's going on in our schools. Um, and... Um, she also has a group called the Network for Public Education that does a lot of good work raising awareness on on how we can protect and uplift our public schools. And especially, actually, in Texas, one of the issues that's um, destroying our education system here is charter schools. And in my view, charter schools are just a means to suck money out of the public education system and tax funneling taxpayer monies away from public uh, school districts that have at least some oversight and they go to these charter schools that have very little oversight and often have a lot of self-dealing business. And um, actually recently I was at a event and I met a woman, um, we were just chatting and she said that um, she's from another state. She moved here with her family and her daughter is in a school where the kids just... Um, do like uh, workbooks by themselves for four hours in the morning and um, they're studying for the state exam and there's really no teaching going on in, in that school. And it's a charter school. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no teaching or education. It's just preparing to pass the test so that the charter school can get their funding for yeah. the next year. Yeah. One thing, uh, just as an anecdotal, this is my, story i guess is i i just felt like i was getting trained for the workforce yes you're just getting trained for the workforce uh to get there on time to do things exactly. get the deadlines on time um wait until the bell they, rings they, until you can stand up yeah basically sit in a row keep your mouth shut basic obedience training yeah. um, and so the educational system i feel like from the 80s has always been like defunded and re and regulated intentionally defunded in, de in, intentionally defunded and regulated to to teach people to be business like yes you know instead of be community members and to actually expand uh our productivity to make us more autonomous more independent uh, thinkers not um sickle fans that follow team blue team uh or team red or team green uncritically right uh, where there's a, uh, the educational system is a long project that looks like we're feeling the effects of it right now. Exactly. And all you have to do is look at the schools that the elite people or the richest people send their schools to. You know, there's famous schools, like, for example, in Seattle, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., around the country, there's famous schools that presidents or CEOs send their children to private, of course, very expensive private schools, but at those schools, they have small classes, they have arts, they have music, they have beautiful libraries, they have drama, they have, uh, opportunities for the kids to self-direct their education, to choose what they're interested in learning about. And they do not teach to the test and the teachers are highly paid. And, um, respected so it's it's no it's no mystery 
you know, what a good education could look like. It, it happens in, in elite private schools, also in, in other countries um, that have different systems. Um, often Finland is, is cited as, as an example. In Finland, it's against the law to charge tuition for education. So what, what private schools there are, they have to be self-funded. They do fundraising, but they, they can't charge a tuition. And so it creates a public school system that's elevated. Like uh, Basically, all the public schools in, in Finland are equally good. Uh, almost all Finnish children go to public schools, so there's not a hierarchy of, of good private schools and bad public schools. Or different here, of course, with our uh, sales, or excuse me, uh, property tax funding schools so yeah. that wealthy areas have better funded schools, poor areas have underfunded schools that just increase the cycle of poverty and the school to prison pipeline. So it, it's horrible. Sorry. No, go for it. Yeah. So I'd like to bring up, so when we were talking about the boarding schools, so the history of schools like in the RGB, so like old 83, it's like one side was segregated at a time and like half of the side was Spanish speaking, the other half was English only, you know, the Anglos, I guess. And there's still like a lot of grandparents and even even some older parents who when they went to school, they were beat up or like disciplined for speaking Spanish. So like that kind of, I think that kind of adds to the culture of the Valley, how a lot of people are protective about like the language and even like being involved in, in like politics and stuff because of that, you know, that environment. And also like some of the schools where like during the, the Bracero program in the 1950s where like they had factory workers from Mexico like come to work here and they go back to Mexico to live. So some schools teach half in English and half in Spanish and there's still schools that do that, you know, and like it could be a good thing, but if, you know, we, to teach bilingual uh, teach subjects, you know, in both English and Spanish, but it was designed like for the factory workers. So it actually, you know, it kind of sent, sets people behind because they end up not being prepared for like, you know, a higher grade education. But, you know, yeah, that's, that's another part of our history here. And also like going back to the boarding schools, like, like, I don't know when exactly, but in, in Sherryland, there was a, a boy that had to cut his braids. He was indigenous and he was like forced to like follow the dress code and he had to cut his braids. I think that was pretty recently, actually. Like, it was not like I. So one of my friends like is trying to like raise awareness of those kinds of issues and like. Yeah, it happened pretty recently. So this this mindset like is still in our systems. Like the dress code and stuff is actually designed to take to erase indigenous culture and it's it, we're still like following it, you know. Yeah, no, I I could see that <laughs> this place is uh, colonized. Um Absolutely. there's colonized Mexicans here. This used to be Mexico. It got right. stolen and then they were forced to be poor. And then when they're asked, when they uh, asked for help, they received it. And once you receive help, that's how uh, the policies are dictated. I guess you're receiving help now from outside entities, larger corporations. There's a uh, history in this area when it comes to uh, making the people here forget their language and their history. The next debate topic is abortion. I personally don't have a lot to say about that. I think of, it's between a woman and her doctor, and uh, yeah. the government needs to stay out of it. Yeah. I kind of... Okay, so the way it was asked in the debate, it was like, can I read yeah. it? Okay, it was like, to Abbott, is emergency, con is emergency contraception a viable alternative to abortion for victims of rape and incest? So this kind of question, like, it's like 
for the Green Party, and I think for most people, we like we are on the side of like women's rights and body autonomy, and I feel like this whole issue, like because of Roe versus Wade, like that was just such an in like extreme decision that we're now we're discussing like things that really shouldn't be up for debate in the first place. Like we all understand like about body autonomy, like people here, like we cross, like you can go to Mexico and go to like get a regular doctor's appointment and get medication. And it's not like, you know, yeah, yes. And it's, it's seen as healthcare and like, you know, it's just it's just disappointing that like you know that we we're so far behind on like reproductive rights on women's rights and it's like i feel like the debate has been kind of narrowed to these pointless discussions i mean it's not pointless like it's the fear is real but it it's just sad that we're come to this point where we're again debating women's rights it, healthcare is such a strange issue because uh, we're told by certain politicians that um, something like Medicare for All is a pony or it's pie in the sky and it'll never ever come to pass. And then you look at almost every industrialized country around the world, uh, you know, we're currently sending so much money to Ukraine for military aid. And I was just curious about the standard of living over there and come to find out that in Ukraine they have um, a universal health care system and they have uh, uh, basically almost free universe heavily subsidized university system yeah so these things that are that our political leaders tell us are so so difficult and so far off and you know the dem we should say you know we're, we sit here um, on behalf of the Green Party tonight. And so some might say, oh, well, you're undermining the Democratic Party and, and we just need to elect more progressives in the Democratic Party. Well, you look at the, squ the so-called squad members and they say they're for Medicare for All. They wouldn't even uh, engage with people who were trying to hold rallies uh, last year for Medicare for All. Delilah... Uh, she hosted a, a rally for Medicare for All last year in Austin in front of the state capitol. And that's where I met Delilah for the first time. And and she, single -hand, she put in a lot of work and single-handedly got a big group of people to come out on behalf of Medicare for All. And I can tell you, there was no elected officials. There was no um, Democrats at that at that event and I'm, they were they were more than welcome and that happened in cities across the country that was actually a pretty widespread um uh, movement the march for medicare for all that happened um last year and um the the democrats um uh, were were invited to participate and they they as far as I know, with maybe a few small exceptions, they they chose not to. And then, likewise, there was another um, attempt to to work with progressive Democrats to get uh, progress on on healthcare uh, called Force the Vote, and that was an attempt to ask them to not vote for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi, of course, famously is Speaker of the House, not because of her leadership or her charity but because she raises the most money and then she hands out that money as uh, almost like a mafia don to her favored um, followers and uh, that's how she holds power and that's how um, she's become speaker and and has so much power and control of the democratic party so that said these members of Congress who say that they're progressives say that they're for Medicare for all and for health care rights and health care as a right and so on. Um, when they go and vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker, it's really hard to take that seriously. If, if you believe in something and then you vote for a leader who 
stands firmly against it, then how hard are you really quote unquote fighting for, for Medicare for all or for healthcare? So that's you, your question was what can we do to move forward with healthcare? And it's, it's a tough because I don't see a path forward right now. It's, it's like a desperate problem. People, um, either can't afford the care they need. They skip care, um, because they can't afford it. They, they go into debt, um, uh, older people, even people, people on, uh, Medicare have huge co-pays. They end up paying a huge amounts for, um, health care at the end of their life and most middle class people who who a few decades ago might have passed on a home or passed on some savings to their kids are dying penniless or in debt because of health care costs if if they if their savings wasn't already eaten up by uh, you know school loans student loans of course but if they manage to avoid student loan debt then they probably have medical costs or medical debt at the end of their life and so it's a horrible problem and it's I guess related to the financial um, considerations, the the uh, the lobbyists who control our system. Um, I believe Beto is taking uh, some of that sweet sweet um, uh, healthcare um, private private insurance money. So when you ask what's the path forward to for healthcare, I think for people specifically in South Texas. What, it's what Gloria just mentioned. We have to go over the border into Mexico to see a doctor. Uh, if we if we have any sort of health care issue that we can't afford, that's the best solution. And I've done that personally. I, I go to Mexico for uh, dental care. I've, I've seen, uh, I saw, uh, um, I had a problem with my shoulder. I went and saw a doctor. In fact, I want to, I want to tell my experience. I, I had a problem with my shoulder and I didn't think it was too serious. And I knew that if I, I had a health insurance and I knew that if I went to my doctor about my shoulder, I'd have to pay a huge copay. And then they, they, that would just be to get a referral. Then I'd have to go see the specialist, pay another copay and, uh, make an appointment months in advance. It was a, you know, so it would be an expensive and time-consuming problem, and I kind of felt, oh, it's probably not that bad, but I kind of want to get it checked out. So I decided to go to Reynosa, and I saw an orthopedist in Reynosa. I thought I made an appointment, but I guess there was a problem with my Spanish, because <laughs> I got there, and they didn't have my appointment. Now, in the U.S., if you don't have an appointment, they would laugh you out of the office or say, oh, sure, we'll make an appointment in four months. Well, in this clinic in Reynosa, even though they lost my appointment because of my Spanish <laughs> problem, <laughs> they, they, they fit me in and in about 45 minutes I saw the doctor and I talked to him about my shoulder and he kind of gave me some advice but he said it probably wasn't that bad and reassured me about the situation and I left and I paid uh, $30. It was probably the best medical situation, medical care situation I've ever had in my whole life. And so, you know, when we talk about the refugee crisis at the border, it's kind of funny. We talk, we only talk about the people that come from south of the border north. There's a lot of people going south for medical care and dental care, especially, I mean, we have a town not far from here, uh, Progresso. The whole town is basically just a dental, a dentist town for Americans, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you walk down, you walk over the border, and you walk down the street. There's got to be forty dentists on that main street block. I mean, literally, the town was built as a, a dental refugee camp. So I think we need to talk about that more. The refugee crisis on the border of people of Americans who can't afford health care. That, that brings up an idea. So people are going over to the border, south of the border, to get uh, affordable health care. But now with this new reality that we have with abortion, yeah. the surveillance of women and their uh, partners uh, assist them to go across the border. It's, it's just mind-boggling that you have the Republican Party who claims to be for rights and autonomy and freedom and sort of 
so-called so yeah small so-called small government conservatism and yet they want to control women's lives to this degree and, and people who someone who might help a woman with her health care they need to be punished too or the doctor needs to be punished too it's it's just disgusting it's rank hypocrisy <sighs> So, so there's another aspect to like reproduct, like abortion, like the abortion debate. I, so I, I read this book about um, connecting abortion to labor, like the way, you know, the way, the way we view the abortion like issue like we think of it as like oh these religious bigots like you know want to ban like ban abortion and prevent like autonomy and that's definitely true but like the the way like our our politicians react to it it's it's like they want to keep the supply of labor so they don't want to give us abortion rights because they want more labor production and they want that labor production to be from the low working class and for us to stay like in stay in minimum wage like bad you know like bad situations so we work these terrible conditions and it's like you know like if they really cared about us like if, if they really wanted like okay we need to raise our population they would invest in family care right like make it easier for us to take care of our children that you know instead of like banning abortion right make make it give us paid leave for give us maternity leave paternal leave family leave so that we can take care of our children and have these children become like productive members of society and you know participate in the economy but instead they ban abortion they make our conditions worse so that we go for jobs that are minimum wage, low benefits, no family leave, no family planning, no medical care. It's another connection. Like, it's like our rights are being taken away so we participate in this, like, exploitative system. I know that you guys are in the Green Party and there's the eco-socialist component to it. And so... Uh, when it comes to incorporating abortion with the labor, labor uh, connection, um, the way I understand it is that the capitalists, uh, they, right now they have the state under their control, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and so by doing so, they also are very uh, concerned about the labor pool out there. And so by having these regulations on reproductive rights, they have a means to control that number from going up or down uh of course they want it to go a certain way and i feel like it's connected to that as well as other components they they utilize the social conservatives as vehicles to push that agenda a divide and rule st strategy that's old old as human time um and so it gets us all riled up with this uh very personal and touchy topic uh that i think is very personal uh, like you said it should be between the doctor and a woman to decide uh, and it's, we're bringing it out for everyone to debate, to drag each other around with our different cultures and our different beliefs when it comes to abortion. Uh, I feel like the people who are in power, which is in a capitalist society, it's the capitalists, they're pushing this agenda so they could uh, determine a certain economic output for them. Uh, I think their, their system is having issues and they're now pushing this extreme agenda which is tearing the, the country apart uh, on purpose so they could squeeze out as much margins as possible from us, which with the educational system that we have, we're very docile and obedient to do so. I agree with, with a lot of what you just said, and I want to point out that it's easy to call out the uh, Republicans for the abortion. I mean, those of us who are for reproductive rights, of course we have to call out the Republican Party. But... I need to take that a step farther and also call out the Democratic Party because they've had 50 years to codify Roe versus Wade. Just like the Republicans like to have abortion as an issue to fire up their base, 
which it does. It, it's an issue that people uh, take very seriously, take very personally on both sides of the issue. Um, so the Republicans use that as kind of a red meat issue. They they talk about abortion. They get voters uh, on their side over that issue and kind of helps uh, serves as a distraction as they're serving the the wealthy interests that that fund their campaigns. The the corporate interests uh, get get their tax cuts or whatever it is that they want their their business deals, and then nothing benefits. Um, the working class, but those working class voters that, that have a personal feeling uh, uh, against abortion, they'll vote for a Republican just on that issue. So that's clear. But let's also call out the Democratic Party. They've had 50 years to codify Roe versus Wade. There's been several periods, most recently under the Obama administration, when there was a filibuster-proof uh, majority uh, for the Democrats. They could have passed um, uh, laws that would have made sure that we are not in the situation that we're in now. Uh, and Obama uh, campaigned on codifying Ro Roe versus Wade. I believe there's a, a video circulating online where he he's giving a speech on the campaign trail to Planned Parenthood and says that, uh, you know, codifying Roe versus Wade is one of his top priorities. And then Later, he's asked at a press conference, are you going to follow through and, and do that? And he said, oh, no, we have other priorities now. So uh, well, we, we, can't, we can't let the Democrats off. To, to add on to your point about the Democrats, not to let them off, uh, just recently in this last uh, election cycle, in uh, one of the local ones here in Texas, Jessica Cincinnati was uh, pushed out by Nancy Pelosi. Absolutely. Like it's It's obscene what happened to Jessica Cisneros if that had been a fair uh, election she would have clearly won because it came down to a few hundred votes I believe the, the final recount was something like uh, 290 or 300 votes that she lost by so it's, a, it's obvious that the money that poured in from outside groups that the money that came from the Democratic leadership that the rallies that were held that the endorsements uh, that came in from Nancy Pelosi, from Steny Hoyer, from um, not just not just them, but I believe that four or five of the top Democrats in Congress suddenly uh, went into emergency mode and came down to make sure that uh, Henry Cuellar won that race over Jessica Cisneros. Now, to do that right in the same period of time, I believe the same week, that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and they're sending out their emails fundraising and saying, oh, now you have to vote for Democrats. This is why you need to vote for Democrats in November. We have to maintain our majority in Congress. Uh, give us money. Give, give us 10. We need your $10. It's hypocrisy. And it shows that the, the two-party system is really a sham it's a pantomime of these two two parties pretending to oppose each other like they often come out and will say oh the, the like biden or pelosi have said repeatedly in recent years oh we need a strong democratic or excuse me they say they're they're democrats and they say we need a strong republican party it's just not trump we're, we're against trump we're against maga but we need a strong republican party and we, i want to go back to the good old days of the republican party so that it's just you know, and and that's a lie in itself because her and other operatives in the uh, Democratic parties are purposely funding these far right uh, groups to platform them, to position them kind of like in the same strategy to say who you vote for, Trump or Clinton, uh, kind of position. Look at Trump; he's crazy, right. very racist, uh, a hater. Uh, this woman, she's very po uh, polished and well and well professional. Who are you going to pick? And I feel like they're doing that same strategy uh, with different locations around the, the United States, but they're purposely funding the far right to put them uh, as a comparison to their moderate Democrat that's, that right. they're running. So that there would be a more chance to pick their moderate Democrat uh, than the right wing. But the problem with that strategy is that they run the risk that that far right person that they're promoting or platforming could also win. 
Trump was their Pied Piper strategy. Exactly, you know? exactly. The, the Clinton campaign used their network of favorable um, or, or uh, uh, preferred uh, people in the media to elevate Trump yeah. because Clinton wanted to run against Trump. Yeah. Look how that turned out. Exactly. And now they're back at it again with millions of dollars, uh, in many cases donated by, you know, small dollar donations by working class people who can, you know, not, not really afford in some cases to donate, but they give because of what they believe in. And then the Democratic Party is playing games like that. It's, it's un unconscionable. Yeah, I think, like, I don't like the idea that, like, like, they consider winning as, like, you know, getting the position. But is it really winning if you have to sacrifice all your values? Like, is it really winning if you say, I'm going to get Medicare for all, and then you, quote, like, air quote, win, but then you don't get Medicare for all? That's, that should, we, we should kind of recognize that is a loss. Like, we didn't get health, Medicare for all, and they lost like they did not do what they said we didn't get any of the benefits and why do we still you know why do we still say like they that's what they need to do to win your purpose is not to get the the position your purpose was to get give us health care the next topic that came up in the debate was the power grid and <sighs> I mean, I think it's it's clear that Texas would be better off joining the national power grid. But of course, also, we need a very rapid transition to renewable energy, sustainable energy. And the climate crisis is here. It's now we're seeing these hurricanes in Florida. It won't be long till we'll have hurricanes here on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And... You know, we have water shortages. I saw in the news a few months ago there was uh, a water truck that was headed between Reynosa uh, on the way to Monterey, and the water truck was hijacked at gunpoint uh, because water is becoming such a precious and rare commodity uh, south of the border. And I, I think, you know, uh, our, our reservoirs are very low. I, I hope we don't get to that Mad Max point on this side of the border where people are, um, you know, shooting each other over water, but, uh, why not take some steps to make sure that we have, uh, what we need as far as a clean environment, water, uh, a livable climate. It's, it's, it's amazing that we have to be fighting for a livable climate and that the idea that it's, <laughs> worthwhile to make some sacrifices so that the earth is habitable <laughs> i mean how can <laughs> it's i mean how is that controversial how is that a debate i, I guess people want to deny the science yeah i think yeah there's just so so much it's frustrating because i feel like people on both sides kind of misunderstand what the solutions need to be for climate change like I think the whole climate change debate has been so polarized that and co and sort of like I don't know co-opted. I don't want to. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's like you know, like even even the even like wanting to switch to like renewables. Of course, like we need sustainable energy, but if the way they're not built and if the the way if we don't also improve our infrastructure it actually is going to cause more problems like if the metal the steel the lithium and all the precious minerals and the materials that need to go into renewable um energy is not is sourced like through the global south and then it's like becomes dependent on like you know the imperialist wars that's not going to be sustainable and it's, there's all these other connections that are not, like, looked into. And that's, again, like, why the Green Party is eco-socialist. When you start framing the, like, the environmental problem with a socialist perspective, you see all the connections with the military, with the planet, with, like, you know, the working class and, like, labor rights. They're all connected. Like, 
the way we have structured like American lifestyles, like, you know, just look at Texas, like everything's spread out. You need a car to get around anywhere. So if you tell people we want to get rid of oil and gas, they're going to think, how do I get to work then? Right? Like, you know, you're not allowing, you know, to, you're not giving people the full picture. Like, we, like we design the these roads so that people drive cars so these car companies get money so these oil companies get money instead of designing the like our infrastructure based on how people move how people live like how people want to live if we think about like where people go like what what people need in their community our whole like our cities would look completely different and that's part of like wanting wanting like a railroad system and like green like renewables and why the green new deal from the green party is much different from the green new deal that AOC and the progressive dems try to push they're completely different our green new deal is considers the whole planet and other countries and all these different aspects the materials that the renewals are built in, the manufacturing that goes into it, it's not just, oh, we need solar panels. It's, you know, we, we look into the economics and, like, what people actually need. And, you know, the international trade, global trade and all those things. I'm being a bit vague, but I want people to actually, like, go to the website and read the green read the green new deal you know the green party green new deal yeah yeah uh, i had one of the, this uh, premise which it kind of addresses uh, the electric grid um one significant it connects to the electric grid but other it connects to the socioeconomic uh aspects as well as poverty so one significant way to lift people out of poverty is to improve cri critical infrastructure like adding more megawatts capacity to the grid so municipalities can develop and provide more opportunities for businesses to open or expand key productive forces like manufacturing or renewables. Uh, residents and businesses in Texas experienced a freeze last year in, in February that exposed the failures of our so-called independent power grid. And so that kind of answer, like what you guys added there kind of answers some of that uh, premise question that I was going to uh, ask you guys. Yeah, and I kind of, like, so when the the winter storm happened, like, the reason why the grid failed was because, you know, they didn't weatherize the grid because they, like, their policy didn't enforce it. You know, like, it was, it was, uh, it was not mandatory. And this is, like, this is, like, so this means that we didn't have an actual natural disaster. And we just had like this could have been a storm if we weatherized our grid that the grid could have handled so what will happen when there's an actual natural disaster you know that's how frightening this is and it's so frustrating when you know the democrat party they just go we're gonna fix the grid we're gonna fix the grid and they just make it their platform make this like tragedy like they're they're like campaign slogan but they don't talk about the other issues it's not just the fact that our grid isn't connected to uh the national grid it's the fact that you know ERCOT and like these regulatory agencies weren't didn't have policies to prepare for disasters and all of these politicians whenever there's an emergency they're fine their lights did not go out when the grid went out you know, so they're not thinking about, oh, let's prepare for these disasters because they're fine during these disasters. And that's that's also a huge part of the problem. And I know I kind of went off of tangent with the other issues, too. But it's frightening to me that like that winter, like that winter storm was not a, like a natural disaster. What are we going to do when there is like. What, what, no, I should word it differently. It was a disaster, but, like, what are we going to do when it's at the scale that, like, our infrastructure can't handle, you know? And it's not just because of bad policy or negligence. 
the last section of the bait, they talked about taxes, how to lower taxes, how to get property tax relief. We need to raise taxes on those who aren't paying yeah. their fair share, and then the rest of us wouldn't have their burden. What, what comes to my mind um, when we talk about taxes and, and the rich versus the rest of us is Elon Musk. <laughs> and, you know, he has an outside, outsized influence uh, here in RGV because of SpaceX. And he shows up, um, you know, in local restaurants sometimes. He was just, uh, I guess he had some kind of press conference talking about his... I don't know what it's called. He has a truck. He has a ridiculous truck that he keeps promising more and more features. And it's like, oh, it's it's going to be a boat. And it's going to do this and that. <laughs> and there's a, a very funny video clip you can see where Elon is standing in front of a group of like three or four of his engineers. And he's talking about it's going to do this and that. And it's, you know, it'll walk on water. And the engineers are in the back kind of like tugging at their collar and scratching their head and their body language is just like, Oh God, here he goes again. And to me, Elon Musk is like a grifter figure. Very. Yeah. So speaking of taxes, you know, Elon Musk has built a lot of his fortune off of public money, off of tax breaks. And it's disgusting. Oh, SpaceX is just like a, a, and SpaceX it's a contractor is, for the U.S. military. Right, exactly. So SpaceX is sold to the public as some sort of like Star Trek exploring brave new worlds, mm -hmm. starting new colonies. In case the Earth is destroyed by global warming, don't worry about that. We'll just go to a new planet somewhere. Well, so that's the public message, uh, you know, the, how fun and exciting space travel is. But as you just hinted at what's going on behind the scenes is military contracts uh, more death and destruction paid for by american taxpayers like that's another way we could lower taxes yeah. <laughs> why don't we stop spending all our money on bombs and the drug war and well his starlink was kind of used in ukraine recently yeah. and so he's there you go he's he's, he's launching, tied up in in that he's launching, conflict he's launching spy satellites for the u.s government so it's not he's not giving the public good or a consumer good that we could purchase uh, or a new hope. He's literally just another Boeing or another yeah. Lock Lockheed Martin, just with uh, a green re uh, green capitalist rebrand. Re the Starlink business or like whatever is 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 funded by by the military. They have a, a military contract, and then on top of that, like we talk about, like. The destruction of the environment, I feel like it's so severe and it's so, like, constant that people are, like, desensitized to it. But it's just, it's just incredible, the destruction. Like, just, you know, just recently, 63 acres burned, like, in Boca Chica from a, stat a static launch of one of the, the, the SpaceX rockets. And so this is just the practice launch, right? And 63 acres were burned. That's the level of damage that SpaceX can bring. And what? And again, like we've discussed, its priorities. It's more military, what? More military weapons. More like it's it's just really just like a, a show, you know. And it's not providing a service to us. And on top of that, we've we talk about environmental degradation on on earth but there's also a problem with space pollution so we're at a we're at a point now where like there's so much debris in space and there's this phenomena called the kessler syndrome where like like okay so if there's a lot of debris right it's more likely that you'll have a collision right just because there's less space right so after you have a collision you'll get more fragments. And so that becomes degree. And so you get more likely to have another collision. It's the microplastics of the spa of space. Yeah. So pretty much you'll get to the point where you'll have a continuous chain of explosions. That's like a doomsday scenario. But according to scientists, we're in the first initial stages of that. And you want to add Starlink, which, you know, it's it's like a, a mega constellation of satellites. So it's going to be a, a lot of debris, you know, in space. And 
we don't have like a, a space debris policy. There is a monitoring program, but we don't have a, a an actual policy. And I feel like Starlink and SpaceX and Elon is going to is going to be the template for what our debris policy is. And that's pretty scary <laughs> because look at how he's treating our Earth, you know. So it's just that's just just a level of pro like level of problems that's you know elon and spacex has created and like that's why i'm so passionate about it and it's connected to all these other issues that we're talking about to the indigenous rights like it's on sacred land the tax property tax issue that we just talked about and it's on the border <laughs> And it added the increase of property value that increases the taxes for the working class, particularly the ones that own their own homes. Uh, when he solicited outsiders to move here, uh, it just created an artificial uh, demand spike in the very limited inventory that we had. And so now we have people, for me personally, like my property taxes went up 20, 25%, while others in Brownsville, their property taxes went up to 65%. And so for that, that's like an extra thousand for some people or, or more. Uh, that's a big chunk of money to be taken out in one year for some working, working class person. So that's another impact that he has with his SpaceX program here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the rising cost of living in Brownsville is rocket, <laughs> rocketing up. <laughs> and uh, I, I would say that as far as, you know, the property tax issue... I, I think, you know, um, taxing people based on the fluctuations in their property value is kind of strange because it, it really has nothing to do with your ability to, to pay. So I think that it would be fair to have uh, an income tax or a wealth tax and uh, find a way to um, change the property tax system so that people yeah. on a fixed income, yeah. retired people. I mean, I, I guess there are certain programs for there's older other, people, but I think it's not enough. I think other that countries that have what you propose, like they don't have the property tax, but they have the other ones. Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, even, you know, state to state across the U S um, you know, uh, Texas kind of stands out for not having a state income tax and, uh, depending so heavily on the property tax and, and jacking up the property tax. There, there's other states that either don't have a property t Actually, I'm not sure. I don't know if I should say no states have a pro There's any state that doesn't have property tax, but there's states that cap their property tax. Like in California, your property tax barely goes up year to year. Um, that's, that's also controversial. Um, there's reasons why that's maybe not always um, the best, but... Bottom line, um, yeah, Texas method of, of funding the state mostly with property tax, I think, is is not fair. We covered all the debate topics, okay. and I'm so grateful that you were here to help us uh, have a people's debate, meaning, you know, talk about it from the Green Party perspective. And uh, Yeah, no, no, thanks, thanks for the invite. Thanks for organizing this event. Um, I think... Uh, there needs to be more struggle when it comes to uh, getting rid of the two-party system that we have here and electing a... I know I don't agree with the electoral system. Uh, I, I have no faith in it. But what I know is that it is a good uh, place to have these messages propagated or m spread around. And so it's like a strategic tactic to actually spread this message. And that's why I agreed to come here, even though uh, I'm already like disillusioned with the, le the electoral system here. I have some faith that by having you guys doing this action and spreading the word about uh, Delilah's campaign, about her messages and how she's a radical difference than what's being proposed, I think that's a, a good thing to uh, back up and support as much as possible. Um, I just want to ask people if they're fed up with the Democrats, if they're fed up the, with the Republicans. A lot of people don't vote. Um, you know, it's... I don't have the numbers on, on the tip of my tongue, but, you know, very significant percentage of eligible voters don't vote. And so I would ask those people who are fed up with our current system, um, there's a way to have your your discontent counted, to have your, your displeasure um, 
noted and that's to vote uh, third party and I would ask for their vote for the Green Party for Delilah Barrios for governor here in Texas and if anyone's listening from outside the tech of Texas you know check out your local Green Party and um, if you want to get involved uh, there's probably a place for you at your county or state Green Party uh, they need your help and for anyone who says oh the Green Party can't win that's because you're not getting involved you're not voting so so help us uh improve the party uh what's the best ways to connect with you guys to join the organization okay so if you want to join the green party you can go to the texas greens uh website it's T-X-G-R-E-E-N-S dot org. And then you can volunteer. And there's no fees to be a volunteer for the Green Party. Um, but if you want to... We don't, usually don't even ask for donations. Yeah, we, yeah, we forget to ask for donations. <laughs> but, I mean, you can donate too. <laughs> but uh, if you want to connect with um, uh, the local Green Party in the Valley, um, you can... Check out our social media. Um, we have Twitter, Instagram, a very inactive TikTok, but we, it might be active, and a Facebook. So our Twitter is Greens RGV. Our Instagram is RGV underscore Greens. And our Facebook is also RGV Greens. Check out our Twitter. We're also do we also kind of um, simultaneously uh, tweeted uh, questions from the the Texas governor's debate. And if go ahead and follow the hashtag People's Debate TX, and you can reply to the questions I posted, and we can have our own you know People's Debate. All right, All right. that's good. Well, I appreciate this time speaking with both of you. I hope there's uh, plenty of opportunities in the future to speak with you guys. Uh, I know there will be. And I wish you guys good luck on this race, uh, especially for Delilah. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the podcast to let others know. Share it on social media with your friends and family. If you want to hear more episodes like this, subscribe today for more important discussions and stories from the so-called Rio Grande Valley. Until next time, take care. Salud. Slancha. Cheers. Thank you.